Hello and welcome to the Sky Sports Cricket Podcast. My name is Ian Ward. I'm joined by Rob Key and two former England captains, Nasser Hussain and Michael Atherton. Uh, hello, gentlemen. Michael, I'm going to come to you first. You tweeted something about being like an arm wrestle and eventually someone's get flattened. Well, England got flattened today. They did get flattened. Uh, and it's often the way we've all been there at the end of, a, say, a four or a five test match series, which are always the toughest series for any cricketer because those weaknesses get exposed by bowlers time and time again um, and you end up coming to the end of a series when one team is really feeling the heat as England have been in the last couple of test matches um, and that's what happens and that's why I, I kind of likened it to a bit of an arm wrestle. You have that struggle don't you and you know England won the first test there were a few occasions when you felt they were really in the series but by the end India just slammed England's arm down on the table. It was hugely disappointing, this game, because they had opportunities, didn't they? That winning a, what looked like a better toss to win because the pitch held together in, that, in the middle part of the pitch, it held together better than before. They had a real opportunity, I think, to put 300 on the board in the first innings. And, of course, I think they misread the pitch. They almost picked a side for the last game and that meant that they were a bowler light, and in, in particular in the lighter way Don Bess was bowling, it meant that really that caught up with them at the back end of yesterday when Rishabh Pant played that beautiful innings. Uh, and those were the areas really where England got caught out in this game. Overall, Nass, in terms of the way England sort of capitulated today, is that just a sign of a long tour where things haven't gone well in the last couple of tests, the pressure is building? And the fight and the spirit, the mind might be willing, but that the body wasn't able and it just capitulated? To a degree, yes. But you've got to remember and look at the side over those six test matches. If you include Sri Lanka, you would say that Joe Root has carried the batting line up a little bit. You wouldn't say that the rest have lived comfortable throughout the winter against left arm spin, whether it be Embaldinia or Aksar Patel. So I agree with Ath and I agree with you that it has followed the usual downward spiral that you get on a tour. And also when the pitches have been poor, like the last two pitches, you lose that rhythm of batting. It's been very tricky. And even the Indian batsmen, you look at Pujara, Kohli, Rahani, people like that have lost the rhythm of batting. So it's been very difficult as a batsman. But you would say that right from ball one, if, if it wasn't for Root and Stokes to a degree, when Stokes started off well, um, I think that the batting lineup has struggled. Again, spin. England can have no excuses. They've played on three or four different surfaces. They've won three of the four tosses. They've misread conditions. They've rotated their side. And since that first test match, they've been hammered. What, by 300-odd runs, 10 wickets, and an innings and 20-odd, 30-odd in this game. So um, I think India have just completely outplayed them, outbatted, and definitely outspun them. Their spinners have been in a different league. The selection issue is interesting, Keezy, because Michael, they're saying if they'd got 300 and put runs on the board, that, that's well and good. Even if they put 500 on the board, would they have had enough bowling to take 20 wickets? I mean, they were dead on their feet before Pants heroics. We'll come on to that in due course. But are you really going to take 20 wickets with those amount of bowlers at your disposal as a captain? No, I don't think you are. Only if, as I said, the pitch is exactly like, or even worse than the last test match pitch so then all of a sudden because a lot of people sort of go well why didn't they have an extra seamer which is right but that's after we saw the ball start moving around a bit and the Indian bowlers looked like they had something in it and Anderson and Stokes I thought put on an unbelievable effort but it just got too far and even if they'd got them out in that first innings it would have caught up with them in the second innings so they didn't get it right they, they misread conditions but they didn't leave themselves any other option. They had no, you want to pick a team that you can have a plan B. And in this one in particular, they went from saying almost that Don Best, we didn't think had any sort of form, any sort of confidence. And I would have picked Don Best. I'm not going to go back on that. But now rather than give him any sort of thing to fall back on with an extra seam or even Joe Root bowl himself a bit more, they left Don Best right in the firing line and we just saw that he was nowhere near in any sort of position to do any sort of a role. Nass, how do you look at the way they've handled Don Best? Sean Udall, the former Hampshire and England off spinner, basically saying you can't treat a guy like that and then chuck him into a test match in India and say, go on, win the test for him. Did they handle it 
badly. I mean, they, they took him out of the firing line, then Mo went home, and then they sort of picked him in the last test match as if to say, well, we've got no option, mate. Does that fill your player with confidence? No, it doesn't. And it's very difficult being a young spin. I think we all felt for Don Bess. I mean, he's not bowling like that on purpose. And test match cricket is a cruel, cruel place. You are so exposed. You're on that boundary. The camera's on you. You go on the big screen. They're showing you full tosses. You feel also when Anderson and Stokes are bowling the way that they're bowling. Anderson goes for four runs in a spell. You come on in your first over bowl a full toss and it goes for four or six. You can feel what Jimmy and Ben, even though they're not, you know what Ben Stokes is there at slip, every ball cajoling and clapping, the side will get behind him, but you know you're letting your team down. I think the player has to take some responsibility though, Wardy. That is test match cricket. You know, Don Best has what, played 14 test matches, 50 odd first class games. That's more than Aksar Patel. He's no longer a novice. He has been around at Somerset, now Yorkshire for quite some time. He's played a lot of first class cricket. His job, when it spins, when you're picked as the second spinner, is to deliver, is to land it, especially as a finger spinner. So he will know, he won't, I hope, have that excuse of I've been treated badly or county cricket's played at the wrong time of year. He will know that ECB, behind the scenes, have done everything they can to make Don Bess a better bowler. They've sent him off to see Herath, see various spin coaches. They've set him up for this tour and he's not delivered. Let's be honest, what else could Joe Root have done after that first test match? He saw in Sri Lanka a young spinner, even though getting wickets was not landing it. He saw in the end of that first test match a young spinner, even though he got a few wickets, was not landing it. He had to take him out of the firing line. He had to say why he was taking him out of the firing line. Then the whole mowing debacle flares open. The problem is with rotation. Don't, I just wish with this whole, my point I'm trying to make here, and I'm waffling now, is that I really wish... Once wasn't it ever so? I, I feel at the end of this series, we're going to give our cricketers a lot of excuses. It's first-class cricket, it's county cricket, it's rotation, it's the pitch, it's playing in India. Players have to take responsibility. They're the ones that win or lose test matches. So Don Bess himself has to take some responsibility. I suppose the truth is here, Michael, that if Moen Ali had been there, he would have played ahead of Don Best. But because England had this rotation policy, and Joe Root was asked about that quite frequently after the day's play, and he just said, look, it's the long-term plan because we're in these COVID times. We are looking after the players. But have they travelled to India, one of the big tours, the big tours, and tried to beat them with one hand tied behind their back? Well, it's two parts to that question. If you go back to the right to the start of the tour what's one thing that's not been mentioned of course is is that Moeen got Covid right at the start of the tour now we don't know what team England would have picked for the first test match in Sri Lanka had Moeen not got Covid but there was a chance I guess given that Moeen's got you know the fifth most number of wickets as an England spinner ever that he would have partnered Jack Leach in that test match in Sri Lanka at the start of the trip had he not got Covid so some of what eventually panned out might not have happened, but for the chance infection that Moeen got on the way to going to Sri Lanka. Clearly, in, in these COVID times, there's not much you can do about that. Um, the second part of your question about the rest and rotation, I really just repeat what I said last time. I don't have a problem with rest and rotation. I have a problem when England, when they're resting and rotating their players, multi-contracted players... Uh, being given uh, availability for IPL and England wanting their strongest side for the T20s and white ball leg of the tour has meant that Joe Root um, is less well uh, looked after in that sense than Owen Morgan. Um, and judgment has to come right at the end of the year. In a, in a year of 17 test matches and lots of one-day cricket and a World T20. And the selectors will be judged at the end of the year. Um, you know, if England managed to get a fresh set of players to the ashes, they will argue, well, the rest and rotation at a critical part of the year has, has happened. Um, but when they are resting these players, I think, is very much open to debate. You cannot have multi-contracted players getting enormous sums 
from England and going off to two lots of IPL and missing England test matches. Can I ask you both a question, actually? And I'll start with Keezy because he always moans he doesn't have enough to say on these programmes. So <laughs> well, well, if you waffle your answers for 17 minutes. Oh, you just went <laughs> on for 15 minutes yourself there. Um, <laughs> Keezy, if you were Joe Root, heaven forbid, you're England captain, you're Joe Root, and you see your young off spinner has a problem, like he obviously did at the end of that first test match, and you're in a press conference and you've left him out because you've got a very able replacement in Moen Ali. How do you handle it differently? What can you possibly say to water that down? I'm leaving him out. What do you say? What has he done wrong, Joe Root? Well, I don't think I, this is the problem, isn't it? You get him, and I'm not saying that people lie and captains, but they can't be absolutely honest at times when they're doing press conferences and stuff like that. And when you have Don Bess, who's bowling full tosses and things, you, you're you not going to turn around and completely put him away and say, by the way, I don't think he can bowl very well at the moment. I think he's struggling. So you do this dance, don't you? Everyone does. The biggest issue I have with it all, that once they got to the point where they felt that Don Bess was struggling with his control, which he had done through Sri Lanka in the first test, and it really came to a head in the, in the second innings of the first test. What on earth were the likes of Parkinson? They had Matt Parkinson from Lancashire, the leg spinner. They had Verdi, the off spinner, out there as well. And they also had Mason Crane out there on this reserve list. So it looks to me like... It, if you look at it now, English cricket has a real problem with spin. You've got Jack Leach, who you can rely on. You've got Mo and Ali, who, you know what Mo and Ali's going to do? And then that almost looks like it's completely it. So when it comes to India the next time that England go around there in two or three years' time, who are going to be those spinners? How is English cricket not going to be in the position when you've got a guy who you lose complete faith with that you can't, you don't feel like you can pick and then you've got no one else. When you do have spinners out there as well, and I don't, Ap, you'll know this then, it wasn't the case that they couldn't select these guys. They couldn't not bring them into the squad, isn't it? No, they were there as, as reserves. They could play them. They weren't officially part of, part of the squad, but they were there and in an emergency or, you know, if needed, uh, they could have played. Uh, to answer the question, Nass, I don't think Joe Root did a lot wrong other than perhaps misreading the conditions and picking the wrong team, if you like, for the third and fourth test match. Um, I think he was well within his rights to leave Don Bess out uh, when he left him out for Moeen Ali, given the way that uh, the young off spinner had bowled. And I thought he looked after him as best he could in this game. And, I, <laughs> you know, you know what it's like. You're trying to win a test match. You shouldn't be in a situation where you're having to look after a bowler to say, I'll put him on now just to give some overs. So... It's too easy to blame uh, the captain in this instance. To go back to a point you made, I, I think, right at the start of your answer, the player has to take responsibility. Test cricket is a cruel, unrelenting, and a, comp a game that completely exposes you. T T20, you bowl a couple of bad overs, you, you can get away with it because you just the game's over quickly, you go sit down. There is no hiding place in test cricket. And if you have not got command of your length or if a batsman has not got faith in his defence, you are going to get exposed. And I don't see how a captain uh, can take the blame for that. It was a long time ago that Nass started that answer. I can't quite remember what he said. But anyway, um, there's a lot of talk also about next time what the batsman, let's specifically look at the batsman, Keezy, what the batsman will have learnt from playing in these conditions. But if you look back to the last time England toured India with test matches, we were out there. You had the likes of Hasib Hamid. Where's he? Keaton Jennings. So it's not a guarantee, say, that a Sibley, a Crawley, whoever, is going to be able to take that information and that experience work on it and go back and do it again. So what have you made of the way that the younger batsmen specifically have gone about trying to work out a game plan? Oh, look, you can see, that, let's take Zach and his dismissal in this innings, in the first innings, sorry. You can tell that he's probably had a week, week and a bit. He's had a few extra days off for the two-day test match thinking, how am I going to play on that pitch? What's my game plan going to be? What am I going to do? And he's obviously thought with Axel Patel, I'm going to jump on him. I'm going to try and use my feet on these real turning pitches and try and stamp my authority so I get him before he gets me. But then they didn't work out that actually it wasn't that type of a pitch. It wasn't as bad as that first. I thought this 
you know, it was an excellent wicket actually for cricket. And they didn't work that out. So then they're going to have to look back and think, right, where would my game plan first? Was that right at times? My technique, is that right? My mentality, all of those things. And then what I think is absolutely vital <clears throat> is that they park it because they've now got to get ready for English conditions, New Zealand, whoever it is. And that at some stage, they don't forget it and they address what went wrong in this. And for all of them, it's, there's different things for all of them. You know, and Zach will be someone who needs to look at his defensive game against spin as well as his attacking game his sharpness on his feet stuff like that the same with Ollie Pope who actually is quite quick on his feet but comes unstuck in other ways so they're going to have to I think back to someone like Ben Duckett Ben Duckett got done by Ashwin I thought he was a good player got done by Ashwin and he completely went that got the better of him you know and Ashwin there's not many Ashwins around in the world but that we haven't seen Ben Duckett since in the longest format of the game and they've got to think, do you know what? Joe Root got a double hundred and then he didn't get anything more. Didn't get another 50. So you've got to think, actually, I'm going to give myself some leeway, assess, accept that that was pretty tough and address it when they can, when they get the opportunity so it doesn't happen again. But they're going to have to be very mentally tough and somehow park it so it doesn't affect them now in conditions they're more used to. Slightly more positive note, Nas. 46 and 50 for Dan Lawrence in this test. The way he plays spin has been fairly impressive. Would you agree? Yeah, the only way is Essex, Wardy. You should know that by now, to be honest. Um, he's been moved back to the position in that middle order, which I think he prefers is where he bats at Essex. And it's not hard. I mean, sorry, it is hard to start in that middle order when spin's on. Uh, although you could argue in this series, Spin's been on very early. He looked really comfortable. He got that balance right. You know, Ollie Pope and the changes that Keezy made and said after the last Test match, some of them made those changes and looked really frenetic. Pope's innings today looked really frenetic, jumping all over the place. You know, um, Lawrence looked very calm at the crease, even though the ball was exploding off a length and he was missing it. He just parked those deliveries, not worried about those. When a bad ball came along, he put it away. He looked very composed, very calm. In the same way, let's not have, you know, short memory loss here. Last game, first innings, Zach Crawley looked a wonderful talent in that first innings. So there are some ticks. Crawley last game, um, Lawrence this game. So there are some ticks in there. But with the batting, they are few and far between. There was no world-class innings from an England player since Roots double 100. Rowitz 160 in that second test match was world-class. Pant yesterday was world-class. And England's batsmen, as a unit, you know, 205 they got because of Jimmy Anderson reverse sweeping a couple in that first innings. Their scores have been below 200. They have been getting out in different ways. And they've had no answer to spin. And, you know, it is a basic, basic part of the game that they haven't got enough runs and the opposition spinners have just been in a different league from theirs. I, th I think two things they need to focus on uh, to improve as batsmen, and that's te defence and tempo. And you, people will say, well, Atherton's talking about defence again. He's a defensive player. And I, I never mean that you have to be a defensive player. But I think actually in Asia, probably more than anywhere, you have to trust your defence. I think there's a piece on Crick Info with Kevin Peterson at the moment, talking about his innings in Mumbai. And you can't get a more aggressive or attacking player than Peterson. But he talked about the whole thing was based on his defence and his overcoming of the DRS left arm spin problem. And once you have a confidence of staying in, then you move, move on. And then the tempo between attack and defence is so important. And I agree with Nas that Pope looked frenetic today. Um, so if you can find that tempo on the building blocks of a good sound defence that you trust, I think you're halfway there to getting runs in Asia. But I have to say these were extremely challenging conditions against two very good spins. See, I, I agree with that, but how do you do that? How, how do you now, if you're Pope, Crawley, all these lads, how are they going to do that for those conditions, for those bowlers? Well, the only way, given the way that the English season is structured, is to do what they've tried to do and what Zach tried to do on his own, is you take players away into different circumstances. So you have a spin camp uh, in Mumbai 
you, you go and play a game in Mumbai or for, for the Lions, you have a Lions tour, or whatever, for young players. You, you obviously can't do that at the moment in English county cricket because it's played at, at, at the ends of the season and you don't get, unless you go to Taunton perhaps, you don't get too many chances to, to play on those kind of pitches. And in fact, in English cricket generally and historically, you really haven't had although you, you got more opportunities when we played on festival grounds, that kind of thing. And so what they've tried to do in the last 10 years is kind of take players outside of the system, beyond the system, and give them experiences. And I think that's the only way you can do it. There's a question, Ath, in the press conference to Joe Root about county cricket and the role it could or could not perhaps play in terms of developing players for test match cricket, particularly spin. Um, I sort of got the impression it was trying to lead him down the route of criticising the fact that there's a block of white ball cricket played in the heart of the summer months in this country, which is going to happen. And as Joe said in his second answer, it's here to stay. What could the English game do to perhaps get more four-day cricket in the height of summer as opposed to, as you say, bookending the season? I don't understand why you can't play county championship cricket. Who's barking? That's my dog, by the way, because the postman has just come. Bailey! <laughs> Sad spring of Spaniel. Why can't you play two or three rounds of championship cricket during that block? Mm -hmm. The 100. I, I've, I've written about this and I've spoken to Ashley Giles and others, directors of cricket, and I think the obvious answer is that they don't want to weaken the championship, that there'll be too many players missing and I get that to an extent but if you looked at it as a development couple of rounds of development championship games what you'd have is a lot of young English players who are coming through and an opportunity to play four-day cricket at the height of summer and because the main grounds are being used for the hundred you'd go and play it out grounds like well, wherever, you know, all the, all the outgrounds that you used to play at, whether it's Southport for Lancashire or, or whoever. And often those outgrounds do have the kind of pitches, actually, that, that we talk about that are so rare in England because they're essentially club grounds and, and club pitches that have a bit more give and purchase in them. And so I don't understand why you can't play championship cricket in the 100. That white block is here to stay. English cricket has panned out its programme, and that is a whole different debate. But it's here to stay. So how are you going to kind of cope with that? Why not play two or three rounds of championship cricket in that time? Colchester, Nass, we could sweep the doggy doo-doo off the outfield, field in a box and just get on with it. <laughs> Colchester used to turn, Ilford used to turn, South End used to turn, Leighton used to turn. That's why we had um, Childs and such and Atfield and East before them. Um, Harmer now in the county championship gets wickets for fun. It's not just about turning wickets. Joe Root said in the press conferences he wanted games to go four days so that spinners mm. could learn about bowling in the first innings as well when it's not turning. Something Graham Swan has said to me and, and Rob in the wonderful cricket show that, you know, <laughs> he had to move away from Northampton, Wantage Road, where it's spun every day, to Trent Bridge to learn to give some kind of control and learn to bowl when it wasn't spinning because that was more like Test match cricket in England. So he became a multi dimensional spinner. Sometimes just bowling on a dust bowl means that as long as you land it there or thereabouts, you will take wickets. So it's learning, even as a spinner, to have a, a variety of surfaces. I'm going to go back to my point here because we've got to be really careful about the blame game. When England win, all the players take credit. And when England lose, it is the fault of county cricket. Right. I think there has to be some kind of responsibility that actually these lads on this tour have actually been given a variety of conditions. They've just come from a test series in Sri Lanka. They've been sent abroad on Lions tours to learn. They've been given coaches from abroad to learn. Rotation, for example, I know we'll come on to that, Wardy, but Rotation and Ed Smith and Ashley Giles will cop a lot of stick in the days ahead after what happened to Bearstow. But a player can turn round and say, I want to prioritise my test match cricket. I have lived all my life to play test match cricket. I want to go to India and tour. A player can take responsibility for their own schedule and say, you want to rotate me? 
I'm not having any of that. Johnny Bairstow. Absolutely. I mean, that interview with Bairstow in Sri Lanka that we heard, you know, people are, are saying that Bairstow has been hard done to because he went home. But in that interview we heard, that's exactly what he said. He said he wanted to go home and see his family. I mean, I don't know if they feel then if they're throwing their mate under the bus because others then will feel under pressure and then you're breaking up the whole team spirit and team environment. But I have played with certain cricketers. I mean, if you t I know the bubble stuff and I'm, I've been right at the top of my list is looking after players. But if someone had said to Graham Gooch, who had been batting like that in Sri Lanka, the way Johnny was, if someone had said, you're going home and you're only going to go home for a couple of weeks, which is in lockdown, and then come back and be in quarantine and then go again straight away, Gucci would have said, no, I want to go to India, carry on in good nick and carry on batting. So you do, I do wish there's a bit of responsibility from players themselves to say, this is down to me, my career. I'm going to do the best for my career. Don't, but don't you, I, I don't, I haven't heard it. The one group of people I haven't heard an excuse from is the players actually mm. you know I haven't heard Joe Root I haven't heard Joe Root at any stage I haven't heard anyone moan about the bubble it's almost like you know I know that you're absolutely right on all of this it makes for a short podcast though if all you just say is well we just the players got to take responsibility and that's <laughs> it. we've got to somehow try and come up with ways because what happens take your point about the pitches county cricket all of that you know, we have been talking, everyone has been talking about this for years now. And yet, and we're all talking, you know, we play at both ends of the summer. You've got a white ball competition in the middle, the pitches, all of that. Yes. But what are we actually going to do? Like Ath said there earlier about, well, if you're a young player and you need to learn to play spin, you've got to take yourself out into those conditions. We have to start in this country thinking up with proper solutions to the problems we've had, not this perfect world solution because you're always in county cricket you go well we want more spinning pitches in county cricket and every county goes yeah we do but we're not doing that because we want to win the championship so what can they actually do forget about the players because they'll keep trying hard they'll keep trying to take responsibility but what real world solutions can we get for the problems that england constantly well, hang on i just want to go i want to go back to your point about the bubble though and the players not making a comment about it they can't if they do they'll get pillared we've heard them say it's a challenge. We heard that interview that Ath's referring to with Johnny Bairstow speaking to Simon Dool in Sri Lanka, saying, you know, I've spent X amount of days, six days in my own bed in the last however many months. They can't moan about it. But the very fact is, it's blimmin' hard. But if they do moan about it, you've got people at home saying, well, hang on, nurse is getting 1% here and we're all in lockdown. We can't do what we want. That's well, my point. They haven't the moaned. Players can't have it all ways, can they? They can't say, well, I want to go and spend two months in Dubai for the next IPL, having spent two months in November for the previous one, um, and then complain when, you know, the kind of rotation as a consequence slightly messes them up. You can't, they can't have it all ways. And I, that's why I do agree with, with NASA's point about players taking responsibility um, for the decisions that are made. But I, I don't think they have moaned about it. That's my point, isn't it? I don't think the players have moaned about the. No, point. I'm saying that they can't because of that. You know, they're, they're not they're not able to. But that that what I'm trying to make is we have to think. You know, I never like this thing where we come up with all these reasons and none of them are going to happen. You know, what can they actually do? What can we actually do to find spinners? You know, this has been going. You know, since Graham Swan. We haven't had an out and out spinner, you'd say, of that class. We used to have them before that, you know, your Tufnels, Giles people who were spinners. Yeah, but this problem isn't going anywhere. So what on earth are they going to do to try and find some spinners? Well, what would you do? Well, I'd say like that. I think you almost have to, at some stage, you have to pick out which ones now that you think are going to be the ones in the future. People like Moriarty from Surrey, I like him. People like Callum Parkinson from... Leicestershire, who looks a decent bowler, who are young, because what happens is you speak to the under-19 coaches. They say there's plenty of spinners around. They then get in county cricket and they don't bowl. They don't do anything. So you've got to pick out those guys and you've got to make sure that if they're not getting overs, that you're finding them somewhere, whether that's going to India in the winter, whatever you can do, whether it's playing more second team cricket, whether it's playing in the hundred, you don't even have to call it the championship, but making sure there's four day cricket going on for everyone else. They'll go and play a 50 over comp that's equally as redundant almost as what would be if you had four day cricket, but at least in the four day game, 
they're playing some sort of cricket that might give over a, a spinner 35 overs in a game because they just don't get it the way that it's happening at the moment. The wider point with all this, Nass, and leave aside COVID and bubble life, is the schedule is ridiculous domestically and internationally, the amount of test matches, the World T20, etc. It's almost impossible to get a Ben Stokes through all of that, as an example. And then, as Michael quite rightly points out, the IPL, you chuck that in, there's no wiggle room. I mean, we've, we've spoken about this on a number of occasions in the, you know, me and Ather singing from the same, same hymn sheet here is that 17 test matches, two IPLs and Ashes, India tour, etc. is just ridiculous as a schedule, as is the domestic. You look at the amount of cricket, domestic cricketers play. It is ridiculous. It is completely over the top. Throw in COVID, throw in a pandemic, and it's an absolute nightmare. But I would have had this as one of my top, top priorities, a tour of India. The one thing I hope, and no one has said this either, the one thing I hope, it's not a case of, you know what, we were going to struggle in India anyway, and, you know, we'll rotate here, and then we'll say, you know, back home, we'll play our best team and things like that. You know, England have shown in this series that they had chances. They went 1-0 up. They didn't pick, we haven't touched on this enough. And I know Joe brushed it under the carpet a little bit in uh, his press conference said with hindsight, but let's be honest, the selection in, in those middle, in the last two test matches has been one test. They've been looking back at the previous test. They went into the day night and played four seamers, right? And it spun absolutely square. And people like Key just fell off his perch and started moaning about spinning pitches, etc. Um, and then they came to this one and played two seamers and Stokes and Anderson were dead on their feet when Rishabh Pant says, right, I'm having you here right now. So they have made mistakes in that period there as well. So you can go about rotation you can go about how tough it is, but they've made mistakes in a series where they could have could have actually uh, competed a little bit more. Um this, of course, has been very England-centric so far, but Nass has just mentioned him there, so I'm going to bring it up with you, Michael. Rishabh Pant. I mean, my goodness, what an innings. What a, what a cricketer that India have on their hands that the world stage has on its hands now. Yeah, in fact, before you kind of move the conversation on, I, I was going to say that myself. What a, what Sorry a about that. What a team England are, uh, India are. You know, they've got some fabulous players. They... They struggled a bit in the first test and then suddenly rus rustled up Akshar Patel, who had a great series. I thought that innings from Rishabh Pant yesterday was just fabulous to watch. I mean, we'd seen him play um, in Sydney uh, and the Gabba, you know, in Australia and, and knew that he was a game-changing player. I thought his wicket-keeping throughout the series was outstanding, actually. Well, both keepers have been brilliant. Well, both keepers have been outstanding, but you kind of expected that from folks, whereas Pant's reputation was as a dasher game-changing batsman who was a, you know, a kind of stopgap keeper. Uh, he's clearly much better than that. I thought his, his wicket-keeping up to the stumps was fabulous throughout the series. In fact, took a couple of great diving catches, stood back as well. And then the way that he changed the game yesterday, everybody majors on that uh, inventiveness, the reverse scoop of Anderson. I thought his intelligence and his game awareness was, was top notch. You know, he bided his time a bit in the afternoon, actually, for, for an aggressive player. Leach came on eventually and put men out. He didn't take him on this time because he's saying to himself, this is a bit better pitch. I don't need to take too many risks. I'm going to wait for the sun to have its effect. I'm going to wait till they're tired. Come the second new ball, bang, first ball down the pitch mm. to Anderson, over mid off, second ball, thrashed him through cover, and he went to the 100 uh, in the blink of an eye. It's very interesting to listen to Sunil Gavaskar on commentary, actually. Sunil was begging him to kind of calm down and get to his 100. And I thought that was an interesting clash between old India and new, in a way. Pant didn't think about calming down and getting to his 100. He put his foot down, got on one knee and slapped it for six. Uh, it was a thrilling innings. The wider point that Michael makes, Rob, is this India side are a fantastic, fantastic side. You know, go to Australia, win so memorably in Australia. It was interesting, actually, that... Ravi Ashwin said at the press when he was being interviewed by Harsha Bogle about they were a bit flat in that first test in Chennai, possibly as a bit of a hangover 
from what they had achieved in Australia. And then they realised they had to refocus, go again. And under Coley, there's, he was a bit flat as well in that first test, but under Coley, there seems to be this dynamic belief that they have. Yeah, I think, we, <clears throat> I think we're so lucky that Coley actually cares about test cricket, that this Indian team wants to be the best team in the world and make absolutely no mistake, they are. For my money, you know, we've spoken about it before that this is England's toughest test, being out there against the best team in the world in their home conditions. And there's absolutely no guarantee that we'll beat them in England as well. Because then you start looking at the Bumrush, Siraj, people like that, Sharma, the seamers they've got, Pant, the batsman, not just the keeper. I think that's going to be a brilliant series over here. And that will then. I mean, they win in Australia. They are near unbeatable in India, it seems. And I tell you what, I don't, and I'm not sure who I've got as favourites for the series in England. Maybe just India. Ath, Ath, irrelevant question, like most of mine, but India's next test match at home, whenever that is, and they play two spinners. Who do they play? Ashwin and Jadeja or Ashwin and <laughs> yeah, Jadeja and Patel? Like that, uh, I don't know look how many Twitter followers each of them have. So. <laughs> like that. Was it Karen Nair who got 300? Yeah. And yeah. in Cheno, never been seen again. Actually, <laughs> Patel never seen again when Ravindra Jadeja comes back. Do you, do you, do you reckon this is their the talent best, is amazing. Do you reckon this is the best Indian side that you've seen? Come on, Keith. Seriously, really? I mean... The batting lineup of Tendulkar, Dravid, Ganguly, Latchman, etc. I mean, this batting. Why have you given him this platform to just get more Twitter <laughs> followers from India? No, I mean, this that's batting like lineup is fragile. It is fragile. It, it, you know, it showed in this series it, it's fragile. You know, Shubman Gill didn't get many runs. Virat didn't get that many, many runs. Rahani didn't get that many runs. Pajara didn't get that many runs. You know, and they, they still hammered us. <laughs> that's the point they didn't even play very well and they beat us <laughs> but how is this not the best? You, I know what you're saying but you look at this Indian bowling lineup for all conditions not just on turning pitches for all conditions you look at their backup you know what we've seen that's what great eras and great teams are made of and this to me I didn't play you know I played one test series well one of the test series I played was against Tendulkar and that lot but this side here, from a bowling... That lot. <laughs> all the guns then. Now I'm going to get nailed again. I've had, I've, had, I've had my record posted to me on Twitter by Indian fans more than ever before. What is your I, record? I know I average 31 and about three in one day. As you don't have to tell me. <laughs> I just think this is such a good Indian side. I think it's the best one I've seen. Well, they're in the final of the World Test Championship and both Virat Kohli and Ashwin in his remarks after the, the test finished looked at that and said they felt the pressure to get there. So it's going to be New Zealand, India. We don't know if it's Lords or the Aegeus Bowl. A lot depends on COVID and, and other such issues. But they will have that test match before they face England. I thought it was a, a good point that I, th I think Rob made about Virat Kohli. Um, he's a real flag bearer for test cricket at the moment. Yeah. And that's important because he's probably the most, well, not probably, he is the most influential cricketer in the world as captain of India and his kind of social media following and every word people will hang on. And, it, you know, to hear him with Harsha Bogle at the presentation there saying how important it was for his team to, to try and get to the World Test Championship final that they want to play and win test matches. He's a, a real flag bearer for, for the long form of the game. And that's great to hear given... Given his influence, um, it's be a very interesting game against two good teams, India and New Zealand. And an opportunity as well. I think uh, Ravi Ashwin mentioned that. And, you know, comparisons to white ball World Cups. This particular side, some of them don't have that opportunity to be the best in the world. So Rahani, Pajara, Ravi Ashwin himself doesn't play in their white ball side. So if they do win that, I mean, Kesey's right, you could argue whether they're the greatest side of, for India of all time. But if they win that, they're the greatest side in Test Match side at the moment. So it's their opportunity to be top of the pile, which you don't get in Test Match cricket. You might be top of the rankings, but you can't just walk around saying we are the best in the world. So that should be a cracking final. Well, we're going to move briefly on to white ball um, cricket because that's coming next. But just to finish with the Test Matches, because that's England done for this winter in Test Match cricket. I'll go around all of you. How would you assess the test side this winter in these conditions? Played six, 
One, three, got hammered in three. And two that they did win, obviously, were against Sri Lanka. Michael, we'll start with you. How would you sum up England's winter with Red Bull? I think, I think three test wins in Asia is a reasonable return. I don't, I don't think you can complain too much. I think 3-1 in India was about expectation, to be honest. Um, I'm just slightly disappointed that England had some opportunities in this series, having gone one up, having won a couple of tosses after that, batting first, opportunities to really seize the game and control the game that were not taken so you can't grumble, I think, about three wins in Asia because winning in Asia is, is not an easy thing. But there's just that nagging um, disappointment there that it just could have been a little bit better than it was. Nas? Well, I mean, we can't... Um, as a player, you tried not to get two up and two down. We did something like this when they won that first Test match in Chennai and we were raving about Silverwood. We were raving about Root. We'd saying they'd turned the corner. They were winning series away from home. They'd won a number of series in a row. And then you don't get too despondent when they lose three test matches on the bounce. But what it is, is a wake-up call. And the reality of the same old nemesis is out there. That when it spins and spins big, we don't particularly play it that well. And that is a, not a, that, that goes back a long time. And we don't particularly bowl it that well. And until we solve that problem, the fact that Michael Atherton says 3-1, we were probably expecting something like that. That sums up where we are with our cricket at the moment. Until we stop expecting something like that and do all the things that Kesey spoke about and try and put it right and players take some ownership and responsibility, that will always be the case. But they are still a very good test match side and I still bank them to win when they come back at home. Keezy? Yeah, I, I, th I think I agree with all of that. I think it's absolutely vital in that camp, you know, Chris Silverwood, Ed Smith, the selector, Ashley Giles, Joe Root, that all the work that they've put in for the last year and a bit, they don't just go, do you know what? We've been doing it the wrong way. They just have to keep the faith, I think, with some of those players that they've backed along the road. And it's part of the journey. They want to get to the best in the world, but they've seen that with the Indians. So they've got to keep having faith in what they've been doing, be honest with what's gone wrong, address it when they can, but just keep on having faith in what they've been doing. I said we're going to move on to white ball. Um, I lied. I want one more question to you, Nas, about the ashes, actually. Um, do you think, we've that sort of mentioned it, about the rotation will be judged after the ashes. Do you think that is still seen as the be-all and end-all for England in Test match cricket to the detriment of, say, this series in India? And that in some way, with the rotation, I know it's COVID and all the bubble stuff, it, they're prioritising the Ashes over this series. And if we do well in the Ashes, win the Ashes, all is forgiven. I remember speaking to Michael Vaughan about this. He said, we have an unhealthy obsession about the Ashes. We're always judged on the Ashes. Have we moved on from that? I thought we had, but have we actually fundamentally deep down moved away from we beat Australia, all is good in the game? Well, only they can answer that. I think we're trying to get Ashley Giles on the cricket show this week and it'll be one of the first questions we ask him. What is your, what have been your priority list? Not only Ashes, but Test Match Cricket in general. Is that a priority? And then which was more priority, Ashes or India away from home? And I think Ath has made a very valid point throughout this. Let's judge them at the end of this year. Yes, they've lost 3-1. Yes, they've rotated. But let's see how they go in white ball cricket, in World T20 and in that Ashes series. I think they've got a better chance in the Ashes. Now, this is very odd for a side that have had a historically terrible results in Australia. But I think because of the conditions, because of the pace attack, Stone, Wood, Archer, Broad, Anderson, Wokes, etc. It is different conditions from what we've seen in the last three weeks. And Australia are improving, but they still are reliant on one or two batsmen. So I think there's a good chance in that Ashes, but you make a valid point as ever. It does seem to be the be-all and end-all as an English test cricketer. Ashes, Ashes, Ashes. We mentioned the pace bowling lineup. We'll see how Archer's elbow holds out. That's starting to become a little bit concerning, yeah. isn't it, Ath? It is, actually. It's one, one issue we haven't touched on because if you think of how little cricket he's played, missed the Sri Lanka tests, played one test, elbow soreness. Missed tests in South Africa. 
yeah, didn't bowl much though in, in that the third test and then elbow soreness again. That's a real concern because he's one of your crackerjack players that you're looking cross format. So if he's got this ongoing elbow issue, that's that's a worry. We might do an Adil Rashid and decide that white ball cricket is a little bit easier on the body. Him for his elbow, Rashid for his shoulder, but we'll see that in due course. Right, white ball, Keezy, we got that to look forward to. In fact, we'll be doing it. Um, five T20s and a few, a couple, couple of three ODIs. What are you looking forward to in that series? Well, apart from getting out of my house, that's the main thing. <laughs> um, I can't wait, really. Uh, I think I love watching T20 in particular. I think you've got two great sides going at it as well. I think that your point about Archer is an, an excellent one because we would all, we were always talk, and people always write in the media about England's batting, where, where should Butler, where should he open, should he go in the middle order, does Milan get in the team, Milan's record's so good, all of that. England's batting, I reckon, I haven't checked this, I'm trying to find out from the stats guys, I reckon England's batting is right up there with the world's best. And England's bowling, a bit similar to the start of the 50 over campaign, is nowhere near, near that actually comparatively. So I'm going to be fascinated to see with the full strength England, touch wood, what they do from the bowling point of view. What are you looking forward to, Nass? It's still with just the T20s. Obviously, England are building up for the world T20 in these conditions. So it's a valuable five matches for them. I sat down with uh, Owen Morgan in South Africa um, and he was really looking forward to it. Obviously, he felt India are favourites playing at home. The IPL experience that they have in T20 he was big on Australia um, with that World T20, but he felt his side had a real um, chance in the tournament. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing some of the young Indian players. I think they're rotating a little bit. Ishan Kishan, Surya Kumar Yadav comes in uh, to their side but also England's batting lineup. I mean, they could pick two different squads, England, and still be very strong in the batting. It should be a really good series. Uh, well, England at full strength, um, which you can probably argue they haven't been in these test matches. Um, England at full strength. Hopefully full crowds, do we think? Um, I'm not sure. Obviously, even though 50% were allowed in at Ahmedabad, it, it looked... Uh, a poor crowd to me for the test match. And if you do get the full houses, big crowds in India, I think we all know that that is just something else, something special. Um, so it'd be, it'd be fantastic to see that. And two, two gun sides at full strength going, going head to head um, in the run up, as you say, to the World T20, which should be a fabulous event. Right, Keezy, last word. What's on the cricket show? Ashley Giles and what else? What else have you got for us? Uh, I don't know what are we do, Vlad. You keep mentioning it. I don't. I, I just sort of wing it and bluff. You host the show. Do you not know what's going on? No, I just sort of bluff my way through it on the. Day. Really, we never, we never saw that. <laughs> That's just more of an idea. Go on. We got Gilo. Well, you wanted to do something stats-wise, even though you said stats are for Pratt. You want to get some stats out there. I think. Oh, well, that's right. We got Freddie Wild possibly from Crickviz. And all these T20 teams, they go on and on about their stat, the matchups and all of that. So we want to see what that's about. I generally think it's a nonsense, but we'll find out. We'll join those two clowns in a, in a couple of days' time. Sorry, Nasty, do you want to say anything? No, not at all. Carry on. Good. So join us for the first T20 India against England on Friday, 12.30 on Sky Sports Cricket.